All right, so again, we're really glad to have everyone here for this evening session. I'd like to start out by um, sharing a couple books that you may want to take note of, or you can come up afterwards and write down the title and authors and stuff. But um, this one here is quite good. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Okay, um, and some of these books I've been using as part of, some of the content in the notes comes from some of these books. Um, this one here, How to Study the Bible for Yourself by Tim LaHaye, which maybe some of you remember that name from other books he's written. And this one called Reading the Bible with Heart and Mind. Okay, so, and there's other books out there, right? But these are three books that you might find helpful if you want to go further into your own study of you know, how to really read the Bible and get the most out of it. One other book that I'd like to suggest, and this is especially for those who maybe prepare studies yourselves for other people or for other groups. Okay, so if you're a teacher... Um, of Bible studies in any setting. It's called Biblical Preaching, um, but it's not just for preachers, okay? It's, it's, uh, I found this book to be very helpful in uh, taking, you know, passages in the Bible and uh, understanding, first of all, the, the basic meaning of the text and then looking to see how to develop that meaning and present it in a, you know, in a teaching session. So anyway, this book, Biblical Preaching by, Robinson, by Haddon Robinson, is, I think, quite good also. Anyway, just a couple uh, resources there for you. So um, we are on page two of the notes. And so just to review a little bit, um, on page two, if you look at point number two, okay, Roman numeral number two, some important theological terms. Last week, we looked at point A, the fact of inspiration, just to review very quickly that that notion, um, it, is, it is inescapable, okay, that the Bible presents itself as being divinely inspired, okay? I mean, you, you can't read the Bible and not see that, okay? The one point that we, uh, or the one fact that we pointed out, that 1,600 times, more than 1,600 times, we see the phrase, thus saith the Lord, and then the Bible writers would quote God, okay? You know, they would, they were, they were, they certainly believed that they were quoting directly from God, which is a pretty, you know, that's a pretty bold statement, right? Uh, so either these guys were all, all these different biblical authors, either they were all just like, you know, crazy, um, deluded or whatever, um, or they truly were, you know, inspired. And so it was proper for them to acknowledge that the things they were sharing were not their own ideas. They were not men's thoughts. These were God's very words. And all through the Bible, that's what we find. And so different expressions that we find that we looked at last week, how God, you know, different authors would say, God put his words in my mouth. You know, David says at one point, God revealed to me by, in writing, he says. I mean, that's what he did for Moses, right? God, the Ten Commandments were written with the, the hand of God, it says. Um, so, I mean, these men were very conscious that they were simply instruments being used of God um, to transmit his word uh, to you know, whoever the, the orig original hearers were as well as others down the line because it's also interesting to see that God directed these individuals to write in a book the things that they received from him. And so numerous times we'll see that expression used throughout the scriptures. You know, God was not just revealing truth to those people that lived at that time. <clears throat> he wanted those truths to be recorded so that people all through history could uh, profit. From that, um, from that divine revelation. So, um, and so to get to the New Testament, you know, Paul makes the declaration in 2 Timothy 3.16 where he says, all scripture is inspired of God and profitable for, you know, doctrine, instruction, all those things. So um, the Bible writers realized that all that God had put into scripture was meant for our good, for our instruction. So that leads us to Point B tonight was where we're going to pick up distinctions, important distinctions between revelation, inscripturation, and illumination. Now, maybe or maybe not, but those terms may be familiar to you, or maybe it's like, you know, maybe a couple of them are. Um, maybe you've never thought about them. What I would like to point out here is the interaction between these three terms, okay? And you'll see what I mean as we go on. So first, let's define them. Uh, revelation refers to God's act of revealing truth to certain individuals, okay? 
So that's, that's pretty, pretty easy. That's pretty clear. So God is the one revealing. He's making known certain truths that would not be known to men if God didn't state it. So, I mean, we wouldn't know that there's a heaven unless God told us that there's a heaven, right? Um, et cetera, right? There's lots and lots of things that God talks about that we just wouldn't know by our own, you know, uh, cognitive uh, abilities. Um, so, revelation, incredibly important. Now, it's true that there's a general revelation that's given through nature, okay? Um, and maybe I should have been a little more specific here, but this isn't talking so much about general revelation. That is, when you look at nature, you can discern that there is a creator. You know, you look at the things that were made, and it's obvious that there was somebody who, intelligent who made that stuff, okay? But this is talking more about um, specific revelation that we have uh, through Scripture, okay? Um, so, the next term, then, is inscripturation. And as the term probably sounds to you, okay, it refers to the act of inspired individuals, so the people who wrote the Bible, um, it's the act of inspired individuals who put into writing God's revelation. Okay, so they are writing scripture. Okay, they, they're writing God's word uh, down on paper, and again, with the idea that it would be preserved for other generations. So that's inscripturation. Okay, third term is illumination, which refers to the act whereby God grants understanding of his revelation. So, God reveals a truth to one of the Bible authors. God directs that author to put into writing the revelation that he received. And then that writing is passed on to other generations like us. But we get this writing 2,000 years later. And sometimes it's a little challenging to understand exactly what is being discussed. And so that's where God gives us a great help <laughs> uh, by this process of illumination, which takes place through the work of the Spirit in us. And um, let's go ahead and read two texts. And if we can, like we did last week, and this time we'll start over here because I think not everybody got to read because we, uh, we didn't have enough text. But let's start with Patsy. And if you would read Luke, um, where are we at here? Luke 24, 45, please. Luke 24, 45. So, that's a pretty remarkable statement, okay? It's all about Jesus, who it says he, he opened their mind, their understanding, that they, could, that they could comprehend the Scriptures. So, it was necessary for Jesus to, in some way, act upon his disciples' minds' understanding so that they get the full meaning of what the Scripture said. Okay? Okay. Um, so Jesus did that while he was with them, but then he promised that the Holy Spirit would come, and one of the works of the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell within believers is to do what Jesus did for those disciples right there. The Holy Spirit is given to us to help us understand the Scriptures, the Bible. So let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, Valerie, if you wouldn't mind reading then, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 and 14, please. Hmm. So very clearly, verse 13 says it's the Holy Spirit who is teaching us so we can understand these, these truths, these words that are given, okay? And, um, and then he goes on to say that a natural man, that is somebody who's not saved, so somebody who doesn't have the Spirit of God, um, doesn't get it, you know? They don't get it because he says it's spiritually discerned. You need to have the Spirit of God to give you that understanding, and those who don't have the Spirit of God... You know, they're going to read, you know, open the Bible and begin to read it like you probably have heard many unbelievers say, oh, I tried reading the Bible and I couldn't make, you know, hide your tails of it, you know. I couldn't, I couldn't get the meaning of it. And maybe, maybe we all have had that experience as well, okay. Um, and then when you get saved, you know, you have a desire to, to really dig in and read it, but all of a sudden it starts to make sense because now the Holy Spirit is there to enlighten us or the word maybe would be illuminate us, all right. So, so far so good, those three terms. 
It makes sense. Revelation, and scripturation, illumination. If we were to take a text next time we meet, and I asked you to give a definition of those three terms, would you be able to do it? With open notes. Open notes. <laughs> All right. Um, but they are. There are three important terms. Now, what becomes, I think, very interesting is the next point. Um, and it helps us understand the distinction between these three terms. Okay? So the next point. There can be revelation without inscripturation. I don't know if you ever thought about that. There can be truths that God revealed to someone, or maybe even to certain people, that were not written down. We don't have that revelation today because God chose to not have certain things that were revealed. He chose to not have them all recorded, which is interesting. Um, let's look at some of the examples about that. So uh, going to John, and so Deb, if you want to pick up with that, please. John 20, 30. Uh, yeah, chapter 20, verse 30. Okay, many other signs, okay, so Jesus performed other acts, um, other miracles, um, and John himself says, but hey, the, we didn't write them all down. And so I, th I think it would be fascinating, well, we, we will find out one day, right, when we're in heaven, we'll get, the, we'll, we'll get caught up on everything, but it won't be neat to hear about all the other miracles that weren't recorded in the Bible, you know, um, and uh, we won't read it now, but John 21, 25 says, you know, there were so many other things that weren't written. John says it would take a library of books. One library said wouldn't be enough, you know. It says the world couldn't contain the number of books if we wrote down everything that Jesus said or did. That's, pretty, yeah, that's not, I mean, there might be a little bit of hyperbole in there, but maybe not that much because when you think about it, they were with him for three and a half years. And it was a constant you know, ministry, itiner the Bible talks about, right, how from morning to evening, he's dealing with people, he's healing, he's teaching, you know, from morning to evening, day after day, for three and a half years straight, all right? So that would take a lot more room, a lot, a lot more pages than just the pages that we have in the, you know, 20 or 25 chapters, whatever, of each gospel. Um, so clearly, there was a lot that was revealed Everything that Jesus did or said was divine truth, but it wasn't all written down. Um, uh, next one, 2 Corinthians 12, 3 and 4. Let's go to that. And so, Chris, if you could read that text, 2 Corinthians 12, 3 and 4, please. Therefore, I make you known, or let me say it right. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God uh, I think you're in 1 Corinthians instead of 2 Corinthians. Hmm, that's interesting. So, Paul was caught up into heaven, and this, well, he doesn't know if it was a vision or if he was actually physically taken there, but, but he was caught up into heaven, and he heard these words, these, these amazing, marvelous, wor heavenly, you know, words. And he says, but at this time, it's not permitted for me to share them. It's like, Okay, wow, what was what's that all about, you know? Um, I, don't, I don't know, you know, we, we'll, again, we'll find out one day, we can ask Paul. Paul, so what was it you heard that you couldn't write, you know, put into writing? And um, so there's that, and then look at Revelation, chapter 10. And uh, Karen. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, see what those things which the seven thunders uttered, I write them not. Hmm. Wow. So here John, faithfully writing God's revelation right up until 
for 10 chapters, you know, God's been showing him what to write down and he's been faithfully writing it out. And so he gets this other vision. He's like, sure, I'm going to write that down too, you know. And God says, no, that, that part there, we're going to put on hold. Okay, that's for another time. Don't write it down. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable, okay, that repeatedly throughout Scripture, there were things that took place or things that were said, divine truths that were announced. And for some reason, God didn't want them all included in the Bible. Let me ask you this, you know, why do you think that is? Why do you think that there is much more revelation than there was in scripturation? Why didn't God have everything, every word, every act written down? Why do you think? As interesting as it might be to have all that. I mean, how challenging is it already to know this book? Okay? So, seriously, so if, it, if, if all the things written down would take a library of books, I mean... We would, be, we would be overwhelmed. Now, I think in John chapter 20, we didn't read the next verse, but in John chapter 20, verse 30, that was read earlier, where John says there were many things that were many signs that we did not, you know, were not written in this gospel. He says in the next verse, he says, but these are written down that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing may have life in his name. So what these gospel writers, well, it wasn't them that chose this, but God directed the authors of the Bible to write down what was necessary. And it's still a lot, okay? It's still a challenge for all of us to get our heads around this, okay? But this is what we need, okay? So it's like God said, okay, I'm going to pull it down, <laughs> okay? I'm going to put just what's necessary into one book, okay? Kind of a big book, but to get it all into one book so that way people aren't, you know, completely blown away with the the quantity of, you know, of truths and revelation. So here you go. This is like a summary, okay? This is, and this is all you need to know. And I like the way, Tim, or the way Paul says it to Timothy when he says all Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, and all those things. And he says, so that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So Paul says God so directed that what was put into writing is enough to make us perfect, or complete is the idea, thoroughly furnished, completely furnished for all good works. So anything we need to know to do any good work that God would have us to do, we'll find in here. Now, um, so that's the first point, revelation without inscripturation. But there can also be Revelation that is written down, so there's revelation plus inscripturation, but without illumination. So, um, you know, I'm tempted to say, sadly, this is a true, well, I guess that is the right way to put it. You know, sadly, this is the case where there can be revelation that's given and things that are even put into writing, and yet some people don't understand it. And let's look at the next text here in Mark chapter 9. Uh, Scott, was it your turn? So Mark 9, verses 31, 32, please. Mm -hmm. So if a seeking for Christ, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. Hmm. So it actually doesn't... It doesn't seem that hard to understand, does it? <laughs> but, of course, we have hindsight now, right? We've got, you know, all the other revelation, all the other scripture. But at that particular moment, when he was revealing this for the first time, they were, they were just confused. They're like, we, don't, we thought you came to be king and to reign and to, you know. So what, is, what does this have to, you know, how does this fit in, you know? And um, they didn't understand. Now, later on they did because we know Jesus opened their mind, remember? He gave them the understanding for the scriptures. But initially, there was revelation and well, it wasn't written down at that very moment, but it was eventually written down, but they didn't understand it. Let's look at another text um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll come over to Steve now. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 14 to 16, please. But their minds were hardened, for to this day when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken Away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. 
Ah, well, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? So Paul, referring here specifically to the Jews, who each Sunday would go to the synagogue and read the Word of God and yet not understand it. They're reading God's Word week after week, and they're not understanding. They don't even recognize the Messiah when he's right there, you know, in their midst. And Paul says, yeah, there's this veil that only is taken away um, when they turn to the Lord, when there's genuine repentance, genuine faith, uh, when a person receives Christ as Savior, then the Spirit of God is granted to them. The Spirit of God comes to dwell within us, and the Spirit of God gives us illumination and gives us understanding. And so, yes, sadly, there can be a lot of people, and there are a lot of people you know, that read the Bible. I think one of the saddest cases, I've had a few c cases where I've met somebody who studied the Bible um, for whatever reasons, um, but as an unconverted person, and did not understand it. I mean, they could quote different scripture texts and did not understand them. And in each case, it was basically because they didn't really want to understand them, but, but um, you know, for whatever, whatever their motivation was for wanting to study the Bible, they, they actually studied it and knew it pretty well, but they didn't understand the meaning of it because they didn't turn to the Lord. They were doing it as an academic exercise, or they were doing it just to refute it, or they were doing it for whatever reason, but um, not out of faith. And so, yeah, there was no understanding. And that's, that's tragic. But. All right, so there can be revelation without inscripturation. There can be inscripturation without illumination. But what we can know is this, bottom line. Whatever God has revealed and put into the Bible, it's for us to know it. And it's for our good. And so that last line there, what God has revealed, put in Scripture, is meant to be understood and is vital for our spiritual well-being. Let's read a couple of these passages, starting with Deuteronomy. And so, Brian, if you would, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Hmm. So very early on, okay, God made it known that not everything would be revealed. He said there are certain secret things that belong to God. And, you know, some of those things are probably some of the questions that you and I still have, you know, right? We all have some questions, you know. And so, you know, why did God allow Satan to, you know, deceive Adam and Eve? Or, you know, why, why, why this, why that? You know, why did a certain trial come into my life? I still don't get it, you know. Um, we can have a hundred different questions, okay, a thousand different questions. And we're not given the answer to every question that we might have. But one day, the Bible says, we will know fully just as we're fully known. So one day we will have full understanding. But God says not everything's been revealed yet. So, but what we can know, he says, is that the things that have been revealed, they're for us. And, and they're enough. Um, so Deuteronomy, let's go on to the next one. Oh, we read John 20, 30, and 31. And we quoted from 2 Timothy. So we kind of give the, the whole tour here. So again, God chose, he made the decision not to reveal everything, which again, for obvious reasons, that just be too much. Um, he only revealed what was necessary, and that he put into Scripture, and the Scripture is there for our, for our edification and for our encouragement. And so that's, that is an incredible blessing. All right, so that's just kind of all background now leading up to, I mean, that's, we were asking the question, you know, why read the Bible, Okay. And this is all part of it, okay? Why read the Bible? Because God has chosen to reveal the necessary truths for our spiritual well-being in this book. And so it behooves us, and it is our responsibility, then to read it and, as best we can, to understand it. Any questions before we move on to the next page there about that section? Still, still following okay? All right, um, so going to page three. All right, so here's another uh, really big question, okay? Um, so which Bible should I read? And if you've been a Christian for a long time, maybe, you know, that's a question you've already thought through, and, um, or maybe you're still, you know, wondering about that. Um, a lot of young Christians will ask that question, you know, which, which Bible version should I use, whatever. And, um, and it is a good question, and we're going to show here today, we're tonight and maybe the next time that it goes maybe a little bit deeper than we'd even 
tend to think, okay? Sometimes we just kind of choose a Bible because it's got a nice binding. I really like black leather Bibles with the gold uh, edge on the pit. That to me is important, okay? Because it's a pretty Bible. And people know that I'm carrying a Bible when I walk into the room. See, that's very important as a pastor, okay? <laughs> um, and it's also nice because it's got those little thumbnails for uh, finding the books of the Bible. Yes, exactly. So people think I know where everything is in the Bible. It's just like, I tell them, yeah, I know where Jose is. It's right there, yeah. <laughs> so those are helpful features, to be sure. Um, but let's go back a, little, back a step here and discuss the whole matter of language. All right, and again, I don't want to, I hope this isn't going to be boring because I find it really fascinating, but maybe you're going to come away after tonight and say like, what was he talking about? All right, so first of all, we need to realize that there were original languages in which the Bible was written. We know that. Did you know that there were three languages at, in the origin of the Bible, right? There was Hebrew, there was Greek, and there was Aramaic. Very good. And did you know which passages in the Bible were written in Aramaic? Without looking in the notes, would you have known which books of the Bible had portions written in Aramaic? All right, so you're going to learn something tonight. That's good. Um, so there's actually uh, two fairly extensive passages in the Old Testament written in Aramaic. One is in the book of Ezra, that's in your notes there, and one is in the book of Daniel. And it even says it, okay? Let's just take a second just to look at that real quick. Uh, in Ezra chapter 4, and I want to beat you there because I got those little angled things there, fingernail things to find it. Ah, I'm there already. Anybody else beat me? See? Yeah, it serves a purpose. Uh, Ezra chapter, well, the pastor has to find the passage before anybody else, <laughs> or he can't be a pastor. Let's get Ezra chapter 4, verse 7. Ezra chapter 4, verse 7, and I'm not going to read that because uh, I'll embarrass myself. So, Nate, how about I let you embarrass yourself? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, re I'll, give it a, I'll give it a shot here. These are challenging names here, some of them. Okay, Ezra chapter 4, verse 7, okay? It says, In the days of Artaxerxes, also Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabel, or Tabel, or Tabel, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in... Ah, Aramaic script, and translated into the Aramaic language. And so from that verse on, or from verse 8 on, it's written in Aramaic, okay, which is what they say right there. I mean, the original text. So if you go to Ezra, to the, you know, the manuscripts of the book of Ezra, everything up to there was in Hebrew, and then you get to chapter 4, verse 8, and all of a sudden they switch over to Aramaic, okay? And... Um, so Aramaic was kind of their, you know, was kind of the common language, you know, kind of the universal language at that time in the Middle East. Okay, it's a Semitic language. And um, so as they go on to talk about these letters that were written back and forth between the Jews and the rulers um, of that time, they're writing it um, in the language that everybody would understand in Aramaic. And so there's this exchange of letters which goes on for several chapters, and it's all in Aramaic in the original Text, okay, in the original manuscripts. So there's that. And then if you go to Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, we find a similar occurrence. Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 4. And so there it says, um, so this is when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he brought in his wise men. And so in verse 4 it says, Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. Well, of course, because that was that, the language, the common language of the empire at that time. So they spoke and said, O king, live forever, etc. And so from that point on, for several chapters, we have this discussion about this vision that the king had or this dream that the king had, and it's in Aramaic, Okay. Um, so it's just it's interesting to know that, that there's more than two languages that the Bible was written in, and some were fairly lengthy sections. Um, in the New Testament, we find a smattering of Aramaic words or expressions. And by the way, this is important, okay? 
you're thinking to yourself, this can't be important. This is important. <laughs> We're going to explain why in a minute. Um, so in the New Testament, we have a smattering of words that are Aramaic. And so um, in uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 40, 41. So Nate, if you want to pick up here, please. Mark 5, 41. That's good. That's good. Which is being interpreted Daniel, I say unto thee, arise. Hmm. So Jesus um, and other Jews at this time were still speaking Aramaic. Okay, it was still kind of the the language of the Middle East, the Middle East there. And um, so he says this expression in Aramaic, okay, however you pronounce it, Talitha Kumi, and then he gives a translation, or Mark provides a translation for what Jesus said. Well, when Mark translated, he actually translated into Greek. And then whoever translated the English Bible, the King James, then they translated the Greek into English for us, okay? Um, but that's interesting. So it's like they wanted to preserve a little bit of the culture of that time. So as Jesus made that particular expression in Aramaic, it's like they wanted to um, make known that this is exactly the words that Jesus used in his original language of Aramaic, but Mark is like, but I want you to understand what, the, what he's saying. It's not important just to give you an expression you can't understand. So I'm going to translate it for you in degree because that's the whole point. It's, the point is for everybody to understand what is being said, which is the purpose of these translations. The, when the, we ask the question, what, you know, how do we go about choosing a suitable version or translation? The purpose of a translation is to help us understand what is being said. Um, and they do that even in the Bible. Okay, they translate when there's expressions that are foreign to the people who were reading the Bible back then, they translate it so that people back then would understand what the meaning of it was. Look at it again. We see this in uh, Mark 15, 34. Uh, Lori, I'm going to read that one. Mark 15, 34. So again, that phrase, which I think probably everybody's familiar with, okay, maybe you did or didn't know that that's the Aramaic language that Jesus was speaking at that time. And so again, they, they chose, Mark chose by the inspiration of God to preserve the Aramaic phrase that Jesus used. But then again, the important thing is for people to understand what he said, so Mark translates it, okay, and gives us the translation in Greek originally, and then now it's come on to us, to us in English. Um, and then there's a few other words uh, that are uh, scattered throughout Scripture. Uh, Raka, that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Abba, which is one that maybe you'll even hear Christians use. Maybe you use it sometimes. Sometimes Christians, when they pray, they'll say it. Abba, you know, pair. Uh, pair, that's French. Father. Um, Rabboni, which if you remember seeing that a couple times in Scripture, um, it's the Aramaic way of saying rabbi. Okay, so the Hebrew form would have been more rabbi. Rabboni is actually the Aramaic form for that word. But when it's used, like in John chapter 20, again, they give the, John gives the translation of the word rabboni. So when Mary says to Jesus, rabboni, Mark, I'm mean, sorry, John adds, which means teacher. You know? So he wants to make sure that even if he uses that Aramaic word um, in that particular context, he wants to make sure that people understand what the word meant. All right? So, that is all about the original language. Okay, so in, in the Bible, there were three original languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, okay? Now, the second language of concern to us is the receptor language. That is the language that the people who are receiving the Bible, that they speak, all right? So, for us, that would be English. Um, so, it's a language that the, that the Bible is being translated into. And ideally, the heart language of the locality in question. Now, what do we mean by, who knows what we mean by heart language? What you talk. Sorry? What you talk. Would you talk? Maybe even a little bit more than that. Mother yeah, mother tongue, native. native tongue. So it's the idea that the, the, the language that you were basically born and raised with. So you might learn other languages along the way that you can speak, 
but it may not be the language that means the most to you. Or like, for example, for years in French, as we were learning French, we were able to communicate you know, reasonably well. We knew enough French to be able to make ourselves understood. But there were so many times for a period of time there, there were so many times where there's something I really wanted to share that was just like a really deep feeling or something that's really important to me. And I didn't know the French words to convey it. You know, I could have easily said it in English, but I couldn't find the right words to convey what I wanted to say in French because that wasn't my heart language. That wasn't the language I was born with and raised with. See the difference there? So that's important because for us, it's, it's not a big question because the English Bible has been around for a long time now. We've got even, you know, dozens and dozens of, of translations in English. But there were a lot of people out there that still don't have a Bible in their heart language. And so... Um, well, I put a, some numbers there, right? Out of the 7,000 plus known languages, um, about half of them have at least a portion of the Bible in their language. But that's still a lot of languages that don't have the Bible in their heart language. Now, admittedly, most of those groups do speak another language. Again, it's not necessarily their heart language, but most of them do speak another language. And many times the Bible is available in that other language. So like in most countries, as you know, there'll be an official language in most countries. Um, but within the country, they might speak four or 10 or 50 different languages or dialects within the country, okay? Well, most everybody usually can speak the official language, whatever it is, but that may not be their heart language because they were born in a county or a region that has their own distinct dialect, and that's what they feel most comfortable speaking in. See what I mean? So a lot of times the Bible will be translated into the official language of that country, so people can read it and they can get a certain understanding out of it, but it's not the same as being able to read it in their own language. Make sense? And that's why there's many groups out there that are seeking to translate as much as possible and as quickly as doing a good job, translate the Bible into all those other languages uh, for everyone to have the Bible in their heart language. Now, the other twist on it, just to point this out, one of the challenges when they choose, like, well, how do we know which group to go after next? You know, who do we know? I mean, there's so many languages still that are out there. How do we choose which ones to translate into and which ones not? And I don't know all the ins and outs of it because I've never done that myself. But um, one thing is they almost have to have some kind of an inroad already with that group because they have to learn the language. Most of these languages are not written and not known outside of that locality. And it could just be like one tribe. There's certain areas where just one tribe has their own language. Mm -hmm. And that tribe might only be made up of 500 people, you know? And so you've got to go in there and live with them to learn their language and then write it down, then figure out an alphabet that you can teach them <laughs> so they can learn how to read an alphabet so they can read their own language, you know, and, and, write. and the whole process is very laborious. And so you have to have some kind of an inroad to be able to even start, you know, if you're not living there, or if that group won't let you come live there, because some groups are very hostile to outsiders, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Or, in some cases, some of these groups are dying. Um, in certain jungles of South America and some other places, uh, these groups are a little, you know, by attrition. People are moving out, you know, as the young people have opportunities to move into the big city, and get jobs and stuff, they're moving out of these tribal areas, and, and in some cases, these tribes are, are disappearing, and their language is disappearing with them. So it's almost like do we want to put all the time and effort into translating the Bible into the heart language of that people when in maybe 10 or 20 years they're not even going to be around anymore, you know? Um, those are just valid questions that have to be wrestled, through, wrestled with to decide, you know, where we're going to spend our time to translate the Bible. So that's the receptor language. Okay, make sense? Now the next question is the historical distance. That is, the differences that exist between the original language and the receptor language in matter of words, grammar, idioms, culture, history, etc. Okay, so there can be a lot of differences between the original languages and the time when they were written, okay, Hebrew and Aramaic, you know, going way back, um, and the receptor languages, which again can be on a different continent, different climate, you know, I mean, everything can be so different. Um, and so, you know, a couple uh, little examples here, all right? And we're going to look at this more fully probably next time now because the time is escaping us already. But um, in the sense of words, all right? And again, this might be common knowledge for a lot of you, but 
as far as the Greek language is concerned, there are four different Greek words that all can be translated by the one English word, love. And the English word love doesn't do justice to the distinctions that exist between these four Greek words. Um, now, some translations will try to bring out that distinction, um, and they'll use, for, for example, agape is the love we hear about a lot, okay, because it's used in the scripture in a very unique sense, talking about the love of God. Philia is the idea of a brotherly love or brotherly affection. It's more like that, more of a brotherly affection. Storge is kind of the, um, the love or the affection that's felt between family members. Um, and then eros is more the sexual love, okay? But four really distinct usages in Greek, but in, in English, we don't really have adequate words for those four distinct words in Greek. And so a lot of times in certain translations, they're all translated by the word love. Um, and it brings, and it causes some confusion. So I think you probably are aware of John chapter 21, when after Jesus' resurrection and after Peter had denied knowing Jesus, Jesus goes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? And when Jesus asked that question, he uses the word agape, which is again, the, like the highest, purest, you know, most sacrificial type of love. So he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And and Jesus uses the word agape. When Peter responds to him, he doesn't use, and he says, Lord, you know that I love you. He doesn't use the word agape. Do you know which word he uses there? Anybody know by any chance? Which one of those four? He uses the second one, philia. So Peter, having just denied the Lord very soon before this discussion, okay, he's still thinking about, you know, how he let the Lord down. And when it, when it really counted, he wasn't willing to stand up for the Lord. So here Jesus saying, do you love me with the highest, purest, most sacrificial love that there is? And Peter's like, uh, <clears throat> I could say that, but you know I like you. You know, that's basically what he's saying. Well, I, I like you a lot even, you know, but I, yeah, I like you. And, but in English, in a lot of translations, that distinction doesn't appear. In a lot of the tra English translations, Jesus says, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus asks him again, do you love me? And Peter says, yeah, you know, I love you. And in English, you're reading that thinking, why is he asking him three times? I don't get, what's, why is he repeating this, you know? If you, if you saw what was being said in Greek, it'd be like, oh, it's because Peter's responding with a different word and Jesus is trying to lead to restore him. And so he says a second time, do you love me? He says, I, I have this philia love for you. And then the third time when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Which word does Jesus use? Not agape, which word does he use of the four? Anybody know? Then Jesus switches and says, do you philia me? Do you even have that affection for me? That kind of a brotherly, you know, you, you like me. You really even like me, you know? And that's when Peter is like, then the Bible says Peter was saddened that the Lord asked him the third time, do you philia me? Because Jesus brought that love down a notch. And it saddened Peter to think, you know, do I even have that love for him? And so Jesus is seeking to restore him, but it's, again, it's, it's a whole, not play on words necessarily, but a whole um, give and take based on these different Greek words, which disappears in English if you translate it all by the same word, love. You see what I mean? So that's important, you know, but again, in English, we just don't have the right words to, to maintain that distinction that there is in Greek. Um, that's the, the different vocabulary. The second example here is grammar, in this case, word order, which in English is pretty important, okay? Depending on what's, how you, what order you put the words, it can change the meaning of the sentence. But anyway, so it's typical in English, of course, say, I love you. In French, for example, the word order is, I, you love, okay? Je t'aime, okay, or je vous aime. So you're actually, literally, the French person is saying, I, you love. Now, for the French, that's the right word order, okay? It would sound awkward for a French person to say in the, right, in the same order as English, I love you. That would be j'aime toi, <laughs> j'aime vous. They, they'd be like, what? <laughs> Who is this person, you know? <laughs> they don't know French, obviously. And uh, so, you know, word order changes from one language to another. And what sounds awkward to us, I, you love, sounds perfectly natural to them in their language, all right? Um, but if you're going to translate it, if I'm going to translate from French to English, Okay, so Chris hears me say to my wife, je t'aime. And he says, wow, that sounded really cool. What did you just say to your wife? 
I just said, I, you love. You'd be like, I, you love, why would you? Why would you say it that way? You know, that's a strange thing to say to your wife, I, you love. I'm translating literally what I said to her, okay, in the same word order as it was in French. But it doesn't really make as much sense to him as if I said to him, I just said to her, I love you. He'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, I get that, you know. So it's tricky sometimes because when do you change the word order or when do you leave it the same to reflect the original language and maybe the importance of the word order in the original language? Um, here's an example. We're going to close with this from 2 Corinthians 5.21. See if you can even recognize this, this, this verse, okay, from what I give you here. Okay, you have the Greek words, but underneath it is the literal word-by-word -word translation, okay? So just read it. The one for not having known sin, for us sin he made so that we might become righteousness of God in him. Now, except for the last six words, <laughs> That first whole line is like, what in the world are they saying? And in Greek, that is excellent Greek. That is, there is no confusion at all in Greek what's being said there for a Greek person. But for us reading that word by word, literally, it's like, what and who would come up with that kind of a sentence? All right. And so, yeah, word order changes from one language to another. And it can affect sometimes the translation. Uh, in Greek, what's interesting, we'll talk later about this maybe, but there's different cases that you use for different words, but it tells you whether the word is a subject or an object. You can tell just by the way the word is spelled. The same word, but it's spelled a little bit differently. It tells you if it's a subject or the object. We don't have that. So if I said bread is on the table, bread is the subject. If I ate bread, bread is the object, bread stays the same, both, both sentences, right? In Greek, they're going to change the way they spell the word bread so you know if it's a subject or an object. So no matter what order it's in the sentence, you can tell by how it's spelled whether the word is a subject or an object, or an object of preposition, or an adjective. <laughs> it's very, very, very specific. So that's why in Greek, they know exactly what's being said there because of the spelling of each word. But for us, if you look at just the word word, it's like, how do I translate that, you know? So then the question again is, well, what, how much of that do I try to maintain to reflect how it's really written in Greek, or how much do I put in modern English so that everybody can understand it? Well, what's the purpose of a translation? For people to understand. People to understand. So, um, next time, we'll pick up on point B, which is the various philosophies of translation. And we're going to see that there are three basic philosophies for translating the Bible. One's called a literal translation, one is called a free translation, and one is called a dynamic equivalent translation. And it's very important because as you seek to choose which Bible you're going to read, these different approaches or philosophies and how the Bible is translated have a huge effect on how, you're going to come, how much you're going to understand of what you're reading. All right, so next time we'll dig into that a little bit. All right, so um, thanks very much. Uh, Chris, after we pray, you can go ahead and shut that down. I appreciate it, man. All right, so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer as we close for this evening. Father, we thank you again for meeting with us tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the precious gift that is the Word of God. The fact, Lord, that we all have a Bible, and again, that we even have a choice of versions to choose from. Lord, we are so blessed, especially in, in this country, Lord. We thank you for that. But we thank you above that even, that we have the Holy Spirit within us who gives us understanding of what has been written down in Scripture. And so, Lord, help us to value that. Help us to spend each time in your word and allowing your spirit to speak to our hearts that we might grow closer to you each day. Thank you for this group of people, Lord. Thank you for allowing them to come out tonight. And uh, again, I pray, Lord, that we would think on the things we've been talking about as we study the Bible each day throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris.